many of the parents are struggling right now. So, um... And I'm gonna be broadcasting live on YouTube. So I just wanna let y'all know that we are starting that broadcasting momentarily. So everybody mind your P's and Q's, we're going live. <laughs> we're down to only the G-rated comments. I always wondered what P's and Q's were. I guess I never look it up sometimes. Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. We're gonna get started in just a couple of moments. Those of you who are here a little bit early, please let us know where you're viewing from and uh, what your role is in your area. Just chat with us in the chat feature and be sure you're chatting to panelists and all attendees as well. We're happy to have you here. So before we, uh, before we got started, we were all talking about the weather in our areas. I think it's about 50 degrees in uh, the Houston, Dallas, San Antonio areas. Let us know uh, what it's like in your area as well. And for me and Monica, we both said it's kind of chilly for us. Yes. degrees. Oh, look, Meg said it. Of course she would know. <laughs> it comes from when they started using the printing press. Lowercase p's and q's are exact reverse of each other. So you have to load the letters backwards. You might oh. easily mix up your p's and your q's. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Just ask a question and Meg will give you the answer. Oh, wow. Right, Megacita? I love that. Oh, come on. You're right here in Irving. How cool. I'm in Irving also. So it looks like we've got a couple of local people. We've got Louisville and Irving. Welcome, Stephanie and Imad. And Tiffany, it looks like Tiffany's from Louisville also. We have someone from Los Fresnos and it's 57 degrees, super cold <laughs> for us. <laughs> That's swimming weather in Wisconsin. See, Los Fresnos, is that San Antonio area? No, I think it's uh, down in the valley, isn't it? I think so, yeah. It's near, uh, between McAllen. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's near. Near South Padre. There yeah. we go. Padre. Yeah. I know there's a, there's a California Los Fresnos. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there's a street in San Antonio, Fresnos, right? Isn't there a Fresno over there on I-10? Yeah. It's 10.30. Are we ready to get started? I think so. All right. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Mary, will you click advance to the next slide? Yes, my dear, I'm sorry. There we go. All right. Thank you all for being with us. We are excited to host this webinar and we're excited that you're joining us either live or if you're watching and recording, welcome. We are recording this session. So if you've registered, you will receive a replay of the session as well as the slides. And if you are watching live with us, please participate in the chat and be sure that you are chatting with all panelists and all attendees so everyone can see what you have to say. If anything happens with our Zoom session, um, please reach out to us at sidelitseducation.com and we'll give you further information about how to reconnect with us. And we are gonna get started with our session in just a moment. So I'd like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Monica Laura, who is going to be introducing our speakers this morning. The exciting thing about Dr. Laura is that she is actually one of the uh, authors of the book, ELs in Texas. 
And she's also the author of many other amazing books. One of my favorites, which is uh, Toma la Palabra, an amazing book that many, many people love and adore. And I see on Twitter all of the time about her presentations. People love the book as well as love Dr. Laura. And she is going to be with us during our session this morning. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Laura. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you. And we're also having here Valentina Gonzalez, who is part of our Silence team, who uh, is also an author of an amazing book, Reading and Writing for ELs. Uh, but I'm here to introduce two great people. Uh, let me begin with Mary Martin. She is a co-author of the book, but she is an EL advocate and a former EL director in a district. Uh, she's an expert in accountability. So every question we have about accountability, we call Mary. She's the one that knows it. Uh, not only that, she's an amazing virtual trainer who maximizes the use of technology. So anytime you come to a training with Mary Martin, you're actually going to enjoy it. And she is going to model how you can have a very successful uh, lesson um, virtually. So that's Mary Martin. And I also want to introduce John Silitz, the mastermind of Silitz Education. Uh, she not only, he not only is an EL advocate, but he is a supporter of administrators and teachers. And he always has in mind creating resources to make the information accessible for all. So um, everything has to be low hanging fruit, like he says. So without further ado, Mary Martin and John Silitz. Oh, thank you, Dr. Lada. What a wonderful introduction. I want to just really quickly say that we'd love to have you stay connected. Um, and we know that some of you would like to tweet during the webinar. Um, if you'd like to tweet or follow us on Facebook or email us or subscribe to our blog, here's the information. And we'll show that again at the end of the session. Um, if you tweet during this webinar, please make sure you use the hashtag Eels in Texas so that we can respond and feel free to add John and I to the tweet. And I'm sorry, um, Dr. Lada will put her um, Twitter handle in the chat and please add her as well. Um, and we would certainly love to hear from you. And so we're ready to get started implementing effective instruction for EELS in Texas. And this is the, our 30 minute free webinar and we'd love to have you join us for a more uh, in-depth deep dive on uh, March 25th. So let's look, think a little bit about what we're, what's going on today and um, you know, what, what's, we've been impacted with, uh, with everything that's, that COVID has brought us, um, you know, and it's changed um, how we uh, provide our curriculum, our scope and sequence, um, our instructional strategies, they've all adapted and modified to meet the demands of COVID um, and the demands that, that virtual instruction has kind of given to us. So, but the need to support our EL students, that hasn't changed. And in fact, it's become even more critical. Um, the requirements from chapter 89 to implement second language acquisition methods and in our instruction, that remains the same despite our current situation. And it can be the key to the success of our EL students. And I always like to start our webinar with a quote from the book. And so I want to have, have you take a minute to just kind of read through this quote? It says, sheltered approach or the use of second language acquisition methods is required in Texas schools when ELs receive instruction in general education content area classes or when they are taught content in a bilingual or ESL class conducted in English as well as in general education classrooms. So in the chat, if you would pick about five to seven words that stand out for you in the quote and put them in the chat for us. So I'll give you a couple minutes if you'll just pick out about five to seven words that really stand out for you in that quote. Oh, I love it. I see um, 
required instruction. And even five to seven, we don't even really need. It's just getting down to the, the heart of it. I keep seeing required, required, required. And I don't know about the rest of the panelists, but if they want to speak up and say a little bit about this, I think required is one of those key words in there for me. I see sheltered approach, instruction, general education. Is required when they're taught. So bottom line, our second language acquisition methods, and that's being said over and over again, that it's required. And it doesn't matter whether our students are in a general education class or in a bilingual class. Um, there's something that, that it's required to support our English learners. All right, so if you have the book, Eels in Texas, What School Leaders Need to Know, then you're familiar with the layout. Each chapter has a section for legal lineage and just enough information. The curriculum and instruction section is a very robust section and it contains six different topics. So today we're just gonna give you a sampling of what we'll di uh, do a deep dive on March 25th and provide you with a framework to support the integration of linguistic accommodations based on the ELPS. So we may have friends who are from out of state who are either with us live or who will be watching this in the recording. And if that's the case, you can take some of this information and apply your language uh, standards and you'll be able to use this framework to support your English learners. So join us on March 25th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. to further explore strategies to implement effective instruction for ELs in Texas. Okay, so when you, when you hear the word framework, it sometimes feels a little overwhelming. We said framework and diverse learners. My gosh, we only have 30 minutes. How can we have a framework for diverse learners? I'm, I'm gonna sort of say something we've been saying in Texas for, oh my gosh, 13, 14 years now, I guess. No, it was 2008. I don't know, I'm not gonna do the math. But we have a framework in Texas. We, we have a framework for meeting the needs of diverse learners. It's called the ELPS. And we did uh, the Navigating the Yelp series, and then we at Region 20 has the wonderful tools they developed, and TAs put them out there and still there. What I'm seeing is that right now we're, we're kind of overwhelmed because this year has been really tough. Things have been tough. Even before that, they became like the career college readiness standards kind of slipped into the background. But what we want to kind of suggest to you today is don't forget the Alps, because if we forget the Alps, we're forgetting our kids. And that it is possible to do that. So we wanted to just give you a little bit of a framework how in our hybrid virtual and sterilized environments, we can keep those kids in mind, our, our ELs in mind. So you may have seen this before, it's classic and it's worth revisiting. And those of you who have seen it before, remember we have high turnover in Texas. We have a lot of teachers who come and go within the majority of, 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 of a slight majority or just under a majority of, of teachers in Texas have only been teaching five years or less. And so they haven't seen this or haven't heard this message. And it's this, the teaks are to star as ELPS are to tell pass. In other words, what does that mean? Well, our state standards, if we have anybody not from Texas, the teaks are our standards here. They are to our assessment as the ELPS are to our language assessment, our language proficiency standards. Now in every state in the United States, cause this is a part of, well, No Child Left Behind, it became ESSA. Every state in the United States has language assessments. And then you have you have language standards that are assessed. And in Texas, that's our ELPS and our TELPASS. But for some reason, even though they're there, they disappear. And when anything really significant happens, they disappear even more. Um, and so, because what we look at is the star and we think the star is what I'm evaluated on. The star is what counts a star because that's what it's gonna be graduation, all these things. But what we don't see is this, as kids improve on TELPASS, they're gonna do better on star. So if I'm a beginner, um, if I'm a beginner on TELPASS, I'm not likely to do well on STAR. If I'm intermediate, I'll do a little better on STAR. If I'm advanced, I'll do a little better. If I'm advanced, I woohoo! And we know because of what some people call the bilingual advantage, our advanced high kids and our kids who've been reclassified, they'll actually outperform many of our other kids on STAR who are monolingual kids. So we, 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 the part of the reason we don't want to 
lose our focus on, on telepaths, even when we're in, in crisis, is that it's going to help everybody. And STAR isn't just STAR, isn't just STAR either, when we think about it, in that I know this year we we're, in, we're having exceptions, we have all these things going on, but what we're really talking about is teaching kids content. And a lot of kids are slipping behind right now with our virtual learning and our hybrid environments. But what I would suggest is that there are ways to do that. And we're gonna provide you with an easy approach that we're actually using something very similar to this in districts that we're working with to make it possible. And that's kind of the framework we're thinking about. How do we keep ELPS front and center in the environment we're in right now? So taking into account everything that John has said about ELPS, the importance of ELPS and um, you know, in supporting our TEKS, let's think about this question. How do administrators ensure that teachers are implementing both TEKS and ELPS in planning and instruction? Now we're gonna do a little activity. Don't do anything yet, just listen, okay? And we've, I've done this activity before. I've done this with Valentina and I've, um, I know I think a couple of different people have used this activity, but I did this for a district and they renamed it for me. And I love the name because the kids are the ones that gave the name for this activity. They decided that it, it was called a waterfall activity. And I used to just call it one, two, three chat, which is very boring, but um, the kids renamed it to waterfall. So that's very exciting because the kids said it looked like a waterfall as the answers came down their screen. And the kids really love using this activity. And that was a second grade teacher who was telling me about her success with this particular activity. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at that question. We're gonna think about it. And in the chat, we're going to write an answer to the question, but we are not going to hit enter until I tell you it's time. So I'm going to give you just a little bit of time to reflect. And then I want you to put an answer in the chat, but don't hit enter yet. So how do administrators ensure that teachers are implementing both TEKS and ELPS in planning and instruction? You're writing your answer in the chat. You're not hitting enter. You're going to write your answer. Give you a couple more seconds. All right, I'm counting to 10 in my mind because we, we want good wait time. All right. And I'm gonna tell you one, two, three, enter. And I can see we've already got lesson plans, objectives. ELPS must be presented in lesson plans, including content and language objectives, observations, planning in the lesson plan, instruction, seeing it happen in the class. And we might want to think, how does this apply to our environment right now when it, we're kind of in this hybrid situation where some of us may be um, totally virtual, some of us may be trying to teach face-to-face -face as well as virtual. Okay, and let's make sure that we're posting to the panelists and the attendees oh, so that right. everybody gets to share these beautiful answers because there's some really great answers out here. Yeah, I just saw that, that's true. Yeah, everybody right now, make sure you click panelists and attendees. And see, we've got administrators ensure that teachers are implementing both TEKS and ELPS. Excellent. And of course, John or uh, Monica, if you want to make any comments, we've got well, some really I, great answers. Yeah, I'm thinking about, you guys are kind of saying where we're going. It's like you read our minds about the direction that we're heading, because we're going to be talking about eventually, like a few slides from now. I say eventually, we only got 14 more minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're going to talk about... Um, just how do we approach that, uh, those, those expectations and, and how do we do that in a, in a systematic way? Um, and what kind of tools do we have uh, to, do, to do that? So I'm gonna move on because it's a perfect lead into your next slide then. Let's see. Okay, so when we think about ELPS, we've got the, 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 the sort of the two pieces of the ELPS. We have the standards and we have the proficiency level descriptors. And they go together like a hand in glove. Now, historically, our proficiency level descriptors, the telepaths, they were written first, right? They were our, uh, the, the telepaths came first. Well, year, it was called RPTE, then evolved into telepaths. We had these standards and we wanted kids to meet those standards. And then the ELPS were written to align with those standards, right? To kids at different proficiency levels. And so 
what, when, what we want to try to do as teachers, and my approach to this, if we're thinking about a systematic framework, we, like we said, the standards are the framework, the ELPs are the framework. What you want to do is think about this. First, if we have a campus, is becoming aware of what those standards are, the listening, the speaking, the reading, and the writing, right? Just thinking about what are these standards. And the second thing is, is becoming aware of who are my kids. So it's what am I trying to do? And then who am I trying to do it with? And understanding, so what does it look like to have a beginner listening, speaking, reading, writing? What does it look like to have an intermediate student listening, speaking, reading, and writing? Our advanced students, and then moving in that direction. And we do have, we might have participants who are either with us live or listening in replay. And um, those different states all have something similar. Um, they all have language uh, standards as well. So uh, you're going to take on, put on a different hat, hat here and think either as a teacher or as an administrator. Tell them about your cute little pictures there, Mary. So um, you're either putting on a different hat, but at the same time, let's put on a different pair of shoes as well. Um, because I told John before that I believe that learning new strategies are like trying on new pair of shoes. You know, we only want to do one pair of shoes at a time because we're going to get some blisters. And so I think about shoes a lot whenever, and, and they're good for analogies. Um, so what we're going to do is take a minute. And if you're a teacher, um, put on the hat of an administrator. If you're an administrator, put on the hat of a teacher and think about our ELPs and PLDs. Um, and so we're going to use, we're going to fill out this analogy. Using the ELPs, and, and we've got four different pairs of shoes. Let me say that first real quick, because, you know, you've got your Birkenstocks that are kind of comfy slides. You've got your tennis shoes that, you know, these are your day-to-day, got to get work done kind of shoes. you got your fancy uh, Fiesta shoes, and then you've got some comfy bunny slippers. And if you're virtual, you may be using your comfy bunny slippers a little bit more than normal. Um, but just think about these different pairs of shoes. And when you think about these shoes, let's complete this analogy. Using the ELPs and PLDs to linguistically accommodate instruction for ELs is like, pick a pair of shoes, because they are, so think through that and think about where you are with the ELPs and the PLDs. And as soon as you've got your analogy finished, if you'll put it in the chat for us all to share and make sure we've got panelists and attendees, we've got everybody in there. Because I know we've got some creative people out there. And Monica has completed a really nice one for us. Ah, love that Nancy, tennis shoes made for the marathon. <laughs> oh look at that beautiful tennis shoes because they are a work in progress always changing direction and speeds oh so applicable when you think about running up and down for beginners intermediate advanced advanced high running shoes nimble and quick perfect let's see i'm going to go back to monica's before i lose it in the chat um, she says that they're like wearing chanclas because they are implemented to make students feel comfortable using language to understand the content. Uh, running shoes because they're supportive. Love that. We all need a little arch support sometimes. <laughs> and I think when we were talking about this earlier, uh, Monica had mentioned that they could be like those uh, high heel shoes where people put them on at the wedding and then they wear you out and then you take and you change and you put on your flats. You know, when somebody's there wa watching, you've got your fancy shoes on. And so hopefully that's not what we're doing. We just have the Elps, you know, put on just, just while people are watching. And then we, um, we take them off. Whereas here, Valentina put high heels for high expectations. Yay, you want those high heels because they give you that extra stretch. You can reach the, uh, the fun stuff on the top shelf that way. Perfect. All right, we've got some great things here. Beautiful. All right, I'm going to move on because we do have a very short amount of time with you. Uh, 
Okay, so we wanted to talk a little bit about this term that is really common in Texas now. And it's, we just started using this when chapter 89 updated just before the pandemic started. So what I found is a lot of folks are either unaware of the change or they are, but aren't quite sure about it. And that is the change that we're seeing in, in our chapter 89 from the term sheltered instruction to second language acquisition methods, which is what Mary calls it SLAM. It's our new acronym, right? S-L-A-M, Second Language Acquisition Methods versus our sheltered approaches, S-I versus SLAM. Well, really, in some sense, they're the same thing. I mean, they're not exactly the same thing, I mean, technically speaking, but really, sheltered instruction was using second language acquisition methods in content area classes. It was making content comprehensible and developing academic language in math, science, language arts and social studies lessons. But there was some confusion about what that meant or which programs had them and does it go into dual language? And there was a lot of confusion about it. So what TA has done is in the, in the, in the update to chapter 89, what we see is second language acquisition methods are required in all programs and all content areas. So uh, with, with where you have ELs present for instruction. So basically ELPs are everywhere. They're everywhere, they're everywhere. The ELPs have, have, have consumed us all. So you have to make content comprehensible and also um, develop academic language in, the, in, a, in this environment. And Mary did a, a, a short little webinar a little while ago for us, I think might be still online, where she had talked about how even in the environment that we're in, the, the requirements haven't gone away. You know, we still, we still have, have to do our very best that we can to reach out to our English learners and include language development as a part of, of, of what we're doing for our kids. So this, this now this is it needs to be done uh, delicately because we have a variety of populations of kids who are ELs. For example, um, we have our SPED kids, our GT kids, and if you're here from another state, they call it GATE or TAG or different things. Our our students who are uh, who have dyslexia or early childhood kids. There's all these different ELs that we work with, and. Uh, we have our newcomers, our migrant, our SIF, our long-term ELs. Now, in our three-hour session, we're going to go into some detail of what's in the book, ELs in Texas. We're going to go into details about what are specific things we need to do to serve all those kids. But I would argue right now, just thinking about it, we're going to look at a slide on the, on the next page that's going to kind of flesh this out a bit, but that if we are implementing ELPS effectively in any environment, if we're really concentrating on meeting kids where they are in terms of their language proficiency level, beginning, intermediate, advanced, or advanced high, if we're meeting them where they are and at their level of language development, we'll be doing what we need for the various populations of kids that we have. Now, can we tweak that and refine that? We can, but the heart of it is gonna be focusing on uh, creating an environment where they can develop academic language. So what does that look like? Now we have our, can I have a drum roll please? If for you today, this is your takeaway. So if you don't leave anything else, you wanna leave with this. And uh, Valentina, can you paste the link into the chat? And so uh, the question that we, we hear is, is anybody really doing this now? Is anybody able to do uh, academic language development in our hybrid virtual sterilized environments? And the answer is yes, and it is happening. And Monica and I, she's nodding now, we're, we're observing some teachers in a district tomorrow together that we've seen before. and. We saw first was just kind of kind of like we all were when we started virtual learning. We were just kind of uh, looking at each other and doing the lecture thing and going back to where we were before. But what we're seeing is teachers are adjusting and they're figuring it out. And the important thing is to find out who's doing this stuff well on your campuses and share those practices with other teachers. So here's a little form that you can take with you that uh, is in the book that if you go in and just in a, either the, our, our, uh, uh, an environment where you're in the classroom watching the kids or you're watching teachers online, you can look at these things and say, are, the, are you seeing these things? And here's what they are. And these all align with, with the ELPS, with what you would see in the ELPS. It's content and language objectives and explicit vocabulary instruction. Uh, teachers using a variety of techniques to make content comprehensible reading and writing in academic English, student to student interaction focused on lesson concepts, and instructional interventions for ELs by language levels. And on that form, you can kind of see those broken down a little bit. Now, here's what I would suggest to you. The framework is the ELPS, 
And this is a form, it's not the only one, you might have your own that you develop in your district, but this is a form that helps you go into a classroom and look at it and say, okay, what am I seeing right now in terms of ELPS implementation? And so what we'd like to do now is give you a little chance to just kind of reflect on that and think about this. Imagine right now you were uh, either observing instruction or if you're a teacher reflecting on your own practices, right? Or, or maybe reflecting on the practices of your team. Think about this framework and how it would support those ELs of various types of ELs or different levels of language proficiency, our newcomers, our long-term ELs. How would uh, the, using this framework to observe current practices, how would it support ELs? So if you could please type that into the chat, your response to this stem. This way framework would support by And you can type it in the chat, or you can also use the hashtag Eels in Texas and put it out there on Twitter for us. Take a look at that framework once you've got it and go ahead and finish that stem. This framework would support teachers who, or this framework would support Eels who. Sure wish I could see you guys face to face and be in a room with y'all. So much, <laughs> I just miss uh, teaching. And you're able to access that framework either through the link that Ms. Valentina has placed in the chat or I'll go back for just a moment. There's a QR code here and that goes straight to that framework as well. If you do have the book, it is page 290 in the book. I believe it's page 286. Oh, so sorry. Let me put that to everybody. Thank you, Jennifer. Framework would support teachers to recognize the needs of our English learners and provide a structure for them to work towards achieving it in their class time. Thank you. Deliberate planning from Juan. Developing teacher training. That is a good point, Tiffany. That's great. You align your, your, your training around it. I agree with Denise on data. And you know, it's been hard because I don't want to be too harsh on on teachers right now and just go in and kind of do something punitive and go in and say, you need to be doing this. But I do think it's helpful for us as a systems and as, as, as a teams and as people to remember, we've got kids out there who are struggling right now. And, and we did notice, this is anecdotal, not research-based, so don't put this out there. But in the district that we're working with right now, we really noticed that the teachers who were really doing a lot of the interaction and we're doing a lot of the language supports and having the kids talk in chat rooms and breaking up the instruction and using visuals. They were having less problems with the attendance and the kids shutting off the cameras and those kinds of things than were the teachers who were not providing the accommodations during instruction. So I, I, while I know it's difficult and in some ways providing these things can actually make it, make it easier for kids. I'm seeing over here, uh, the framework support teachers meeting students where they are to plan instruction that will make content comprehensible. Thank you, Gabriela. And so uh, please uh, contact us on uh, Twitter or, and, and post your reflections and your thoughts. And also, uh, I think it's March 25th. Uh, Mary, do you wanna close us out? Yep, so on March 25th, we have our, uh, day three, which is our deeper dive into what we've been kind of going over here in our 30 minutes. Um, and so we've got that in-depth training and we would love to see you there. And that will be um, uh, John and I. And then you can see we've got um, oh, overall our trainings on 520 and that's uh, Dr. Lada and I will be doing developing high effective EL programs in Texas. And then six, nine, we've got making data informed decisions for ELs in Texas. And that would be John and I as well. And on the implementing effective instruction, the, the, the next three hours that we're doing, we yeah. are gonna go into 
detail for those various populations of kids, the newcomers, our uh, SIFE kids, our long-term ELs, our migrant students, and with a, with a very large number of unaccompanied minors who are, are coming right now to, to Texas right now. And so we are gonna spend some time talking about what do we do for some of our, our SIFE kids and how do we prepare for uh, some of the changes that we're gonna be seeing. Most definitely. Um, and then here's the uh, regis the uh, link to register for the two additional free webinars that we have going on. And so the next one coming up will be April, April 21st, and that will be with um, Dr. Monica Lara and myself. And then the last one is making data informed decisions for ELs in Texas. All right. And so please don't forget about the Sidelets Ed chat and the blog. That is 7 to 7.30 p.m. first and third Tuesday. And Miss Valentina is always very active on that. And it is an awesome opportunity to learn some things and, and to it's connect. Is our topic tonight? Yes, um, we have Natalia Heckman this evening. We're talking about best practices for uh, secondary ELs in writing. So we're really excited about the chat tonight. It's a perfect time well, to build Jody, your PLC. Jody, who just joined us, says that she loves the, the, the chat and she's going to be there tonight. Yes. Thank you, Jody. Perfect. Well, we thank you for being here with us. And we made it right on the dot with our 30 minutes. There's a lot of information. Well, you guys are awesome. Our sessions because those sessions are very interactive and then you will get to ask questions and interact with the presenters. So it's different. Yes, you guys are just amazing. The, the wealth of knowledge and everything you share. Uh, people are just so grateful um, to you all for, for giving them this resource. Uh, these webinars are just excellent. All right. Thank you so much, friends. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining Bye. us. And be sure to connect with us on Twitter and on Facebook and all of our different resources that we have. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.